Okay, good morning. We're going to be looking at Caesar Octavian's successors and how he begins to build his image as Emporata. Now, in your Goldsworthy book, I'd like you to read the section, um, and I'll give you the page numbers at the end of this, because one of the things is the term Emporata actually implies like military victor, doesn't it? And this is going to be a big problem. This has been a big problem for Octavian so far. And we're going to look at how he addresses this in the future, okay? Now, first you will remember the Pact of Mycenae in 39 BCE. This was a treaty to end the naval blockade of the Italian peninsula during the Sicilian Revolt. And if we're honest, that was a loss, really, for Octavian, because he tried to classify Sextus as a pirate and as a rebel. We don't have many sources on this, obviously, because they were destroyed. But actually, we know that Sextus shouldn't just be seen as a pirate. Many of uh, the Libertores, the conspirators, went to, to see him. And he also protected many of the prescribed people. So it might be more accurate to see Sextus as a kind of Republican figure who really is challenging Octavian's authority. So we know that this pact is signed, but also we suspect that Octavian didn't sign it with the best of intentions. Okay. And um, just moving on, this is confirmed by the fact that it's clearly a, a scheme by Octavian. It's a way, perhaps it's best to see it as a way of buying time. We know that he wasn't very good in naval matters, and neither was his chief general, Agrippa, at the time. In fact, the Romans, in terms of the navy, came to the navy quite late, and even Julius Caesar uh, often claimed that there was no difference between naval battles and land battles, and I think that history will show us that's not true. So what Octavian does is he institutes a massive shipbuilding program almost immediately following the Pact of Mycenaeum. Now that shows you how shrewd Octavian is. He's bought time and now he's really preparing and he's trying to learn from his previous defeat. Octavian is very unhappy with Sextus controlling the area of Corsica and the islands around it of Sicily. And we know that he's also unhappy with Sextus as consul, because this has legitimized Sextus and turned him from being a pirate to being a consul, a leader of Rome. So this immediately he plans to eliminate him and to move forward. And this is confirmed in 38 BCE when he launches a surprise attack on Sicily. It is an absolute disaster. A combination of bad weather and bad strategy means that over half the fleet is immediately destroyed. In the meantime, Octavian has used the precious resources that he's gained from the temporary peace, and he's wasted those. And they came at a high cost, because let's not forget that Octavian is deeply unpopular now. He's associated with famine, He's associated with elements of civil war. Yes, he has supporters, but there's evidence of a lot of unrest, etc. Worse still is the fact that Sextus' blockade is back in place. Famine returns to Italy, and there are rumblings of social unrest everywhere. As a result of this, Octavian's military reputation suffers even further. Let's not forget, when he returned from Philippi, yes, he's basking in the glory of victory, but his own military reputation is not great. And there are rumors of the fact that he was sick during this campaign. So he's not really someone who deserves that term, Imperator. Fortunately for him, he has a wonderful buddy, Agrippa. Marcus Agrippa, and we're going to do more lessons on Agrippa. He's one of the key people who keep Octavian in, uh, in power. He's a fascinating man who rose up the ranks and is intensely and fiercely loyal to um, Octavian, partly because Octavian spared his brother after the assassination of Julius Caesar. 
Now, Agrippa has been in Gaul, and unlike Octavian, he's an immensely successful general. He has subdued Gaul, there have been some rebellions there, and when he returns, he's supposed to have a triumph. And this is one of the things that you learn about Agrippa. He forgoes the triumph because he does not want to upset Octavian. This is going to be a pattern throughout his career that he achieves enormous things for Octavian and asks for very little in return. What a great ally to have. So Antony and Octavian, we know, renew the alliance. They have to because they need each other at this particular point. Antony, as you know, gives Octavian ships. Octavian shrewdly holds back on their legions, doesn't he? And they never really arrive for Antony's uh, Parthian campaign. So this wonderful loyal friend, Agrippa, was probably with Octavian in the Battle of Philippi. We're told this by Pliny the Elder. We can't be sure. We know that Agrippa successfully concluded the Perusian War. He's the one who won the siege at Perugia. He's the one who defeats Lucius Antonius. We know as well that he subdued Gaul. And now he's going to go on to defeat Sextus. And even more than that, he will go on to be the key person in the Battle of Actium, in which, spoiler alert, Antony is defeated. So Agrippa immediately prepares for battle. And here's the thing, here's the evidence of what a fantastic military planner Agrippa is. He doesn't know much about naval battles, etc. But what he realises is that he needs to buy some time and he's going to camouflage his campaign. So what he does is he trains his navy on a lake and he builds a secret canal to the sea. And the wonderful thing is that this lake is surrounded by thick woodland so that it's all camouflaged. And he builds this new fleet from scratch. He even experiments with new technology, this huge grappling hook, which is going to prove very successful. And he starts to build bigger boats because he realizes that Sextus has got these smaller, more maneuverable boats. But he understands in terms of a war clash, the bigger boats will be really important. And of course, Antony's ships that he sends are also incredibly useful. Now, I put here a little website for you to have a look at. It's a funny one. It's called Badass of the Week. And it's got a really interesting uh, entry on Marcus Agrippa. So I recommend that you have a look at that because he is definitely a badass. <coughs> in spite of these incredible preparations, etc., Sextus somehow gets wind of some of this. He anticipates the attack. And uh, he manages to intercept Agrippa's uh, invading fleet. And uh, again, bad weather and bad luck means that uh, Agrippa loses over half his fleet. Again, so things are looking really bad. But a significant number of ships do survive. Now, you will recall the third member of the triumvirate, who we speak of very seldom, Lepidus, is in Africa, you may remember. Now, Lepidus is part of this invading force, and he's bringing legions over from Africa. And I, it, had it not been for Lepidus, I think the um, defeat of Sextus would have been a disaster. So Lepidus actually manages to land his, um, his legions in Sicily. Octavian and Agrippa seek to force a confrontation, and Agrippa personally takes command of the fleet. I really want to emphasize again how important Agrippa is in Octavian's life. So what happens? Well, we don't need to go into all of the detail about the actual victory, but it becomes a battle between Sextus and Agrippa's navy in 36 BCE. And here's the thing. Octavian is, uh, finds himself isolated and manages to escape. But during the battle, it's another of those wonderful little anecdotes, he falls into a stupor and lies down and is unable to be woken. So you can imagine it's wonderful propaganda for Antony. It's a similar thing that happened in the Battle of Philippi 
And you may recall that when Antony first goes to visit uh, Julius Caesar in Spain, he fell ill there too. So it's a gift, a propaganda gift for Antony. So it's a victory, but it's not a victory of personal glory for um, Octavian. Fortunately, however, we know that Agrippa doesn't ask for the glory. He tends to give it to his buddy Octavian. So poor old Sextus flees, um, and he is caught in Greece, where he is executed. Octavian is now able to paint himself as the liberator of Rome. And as the food supplies increase and come flooding back, so he's able to build his reputation. Octavian is also able to start some of the improvements that he wants to make in Rome, to temples, to roads, to reforms. And this is something we'll be covering in future lessons. He becomes a brilliant administrator in many ways. And this is one of the key moments that allow him to concentrate on more of a domestic agenda. So as I said, the famine comes to an end. And um, from the point of view of uh, Sextus dying, uh, this is, he's the last of the die-hard Republicans. So symbolically, it's really important that a big enemy of Octavian is finished. Now, to make things even better for Octavian, Lapidus feels really uh, that he hasn't had the recognition that he deserves. So he demands that Octavian and Antony cede him the territory, Corsica and Sicily, etc., that Sextus controlled. And it looks like there may be another period of civil war. Lepidus is there with his legions. But here's the thing. Once again, the name of Caesar wins. And Octavian goes into Lepidus's camp and is able to convince a number of the troops to change sides and to defect to him. Now, the circumstances are a little bit unclear, but the episode is an absolute disaster for Lepidus. And as a result of this, he is thrown out of the triumvirate and he loses all of his legions and all of his honours apart from his position as Pontifex Maximus, as the high priest of Rome. And he's sent into an exile in Circe over here. Can you see? The interesting thing you'll notice is that before this, Octavian had a reputation, and Suetonius confirmed this for us, of being brutal and of being really into rough, tough justice. This time, he can follow his father's famous Clementia, can't he? And he allows Alepidus to survive, and he doesn't take that position off him. So you see how he's building a reputation, maybe, as being a little bit more statesmanlike, a little bit more merciful. Here he's not killing fathers and sons, like Suetonius tells us. Suetonius writes in chapter 17, after Pompey's flight, Augustus's other colleague, Marcus Lepidus, whom he had summoned from Africa to help him, was puffed up by confidence. Look at Suetonius's bias, puffed up. Makes him seem very weak, doesn't it? Um, but Augustus stripped him of his army, and though he granted him his life when he sued for it, he banished him for all time to Circe. There you are. So Suetonius also confirming this idea that on this particular occasion, Octavian has acted with Clementia. So it's a really key moment in the construction of Octavian as an emperor. Antony is disastrous, as we know, in 36 BCE in Parthia. He's absolutely routed, and he's never going to recover. He's lost reputation, he's lost troops, he's lost wealth, he's lost the loyalty as well of many of the troops. Octavian, by contrast, is now a success. He's defeated Sextus Pompey, and Sextus Pompey was a big deal in his day. He is now able to concentrate on building his reputation. So I'm going to argue it's time for him to emerge from Caesar's shadow as Divi Filius. He's been son of a god, he's traded on that name, he'll continue to trade on that name. 
but he will also start to build his own brand now. And that's a big thing in the course, because one of the things that Octavian does as he is going to transition to Augustus is to reinvent himself and change his reputation. So he's at the point, though, where he still needs some military victories. And that's going to take us to the next lesson, because he's going to go to Illyria over here, which you can see it borders Italy, is absolutely key ter territory, and it hasn't really been properly subdued. It's filled with fierce mountain tribes, and it will give Octavian the opportunity of starting to define him as a military victor at the very time that Antony is losing his reputation.